Hey, before we get into the meat of the podcast, we're going to put the please up front. Like, subscribe, share. <laughs> Check out Lux's art on DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Google+, Facebook, Reddit, Mastodon servers, etc. Thank you, and please enjoy our thoughts. Hello, I am the wonderful Lux. He's exaggerating, and I'm Ember. <laughs> and this is our thoughts on Ruby, Volume 5, Episodes 5 and 6. And I still have no idea what I'm going to color or draw for this one. Well, we got to see all four of Team Ruby. Also, Pura and Penny both got mentions. You were looking for an excuse to color your Penny drawing. Yeah. I was hoping for the excuse of someone that looks like Penny showing up, or Penny herself. <laughs> Same with Pira. Yes, we know technically they were killed, but it's a fantasy story. That doesn't stop anything. Yeah, especially since someone was already mentioned of coming back to life. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Ozpin. Yes, and that's canon. Mm -hmm. But to the actual story, what did you think of these episodes? I remember you saying, you know, I didn't really have much to say. It was more of, I don't know what to say. They're very solid. They pass by quickly. Things just keep getting more and more intriguing and interesting. We keep getting world building and story development and character development because we're finding out that those devoted disciples of Adams aren't quite as devoted as we thought. Yeah, they're working towards something of their own by the sound of it. I think specifically it's whoever's best for Faunus in general, at least their view of best for Faunus in general, that they're going for. Because they already see that Adam's coming a bit unhinged. And so they're like, okay, we're going to stick with Adam for now, and then we're going to change horses. It's almost like maybe this is a way out there theory. Maybe they're waiting until they find someone who will work better, and maybe it's the chameleon girl. Like I said, way out there. It's also interesting that we got a better look at the portrait that we see from the title sequence because those two devotees were standing in front of it and they had their meeting with Aelita in front of it. Hmm. So we got a little bit better look at it, but even with that, it's still very shadowed. And the only thing I can say is it's probably not former High Leader Sienna. No, but I got an idea based on the fact that there's a communication projector there apparently, where you can receive messages. Maybe in the intro, Aelita was receiving a message. Or possibly sending one, depending mm. on how things were going. We know that she doesn't want to be in conflict with Blake, but she's going to be because of her devotion to the cause of the Faunus. That's the problem, is both Blake and Aelita want the same thing, but they have two different routes at this point. And I like the back and forth between Yang and her mother. Very interesting, because we know that Yang was so totally obsessed with finding her mother and getting answers and that she hadn't given up that search. And now she's being offered all those things and she's tossing them aside because there's something else she considers more valuable. Her sister. Mm-hmm. Because she doesn't care if she's involved with Crow or not. She just knows she's gotten more out of Crow than out of her own mother. Yes, though... Now that she's seen Raven's transformation, she's going to be thinking back to all the times she's seen that Raven. Mm. I think she even mentioned that that Raven looks familiar. Oh, she said, I've seen that Raven before. So now she knows that whenever she saw that Raven, it was actually her mother. Which is still going to piss her off because you were that close and you couldn't bother to even come say hi. You didn't have to show me the transformation. You could have, you know, transformed out of sight. And it sounds like Ospin may have been helpful in giving them that power, or in some way gave them that power. Yes, Raven implied very seriously that she and Crow were given magic by Ospin. Because it's not their semblance, because we know both Crow and Raven's semblances. So it's definitely not a semblance, because as far as I know, nobody has more than one semblance. I also like the scene right after they go through the portal where Crow goes. Uh, Raven? <laughs> <laughs> I don't need her right now, but you are different. You, on the other hand, I am very glad to see. And I like that she was able to take the bike through the portal. That's a very nice bike. I was really thinking she might have to leave it behind. And also I was thinking, oh, I hope there's enough room on the other side of the portal for that bike and that she's not driving it too fast. Mm-hmm. 
It sounds like it was just a slow kind of just idle through. <laughs> Though I think it was the sound of the motorcycle that kind of gave it away for Crow. Because who else could possibly be coming through one of Raven's portals that would have a motorcycle? I bet you Crow has a bunch of questions for Yang, and Yang now has a ton of questions for Crow. And I hope she takes all the information that Crow's going to give her correctly. Because it's going to be kind of difficult because Raven's already warned her that things were being kept from her. And Ruby's the only one from Team Ruby who got the story. Because everyone else that got to hear the information was Team Juniper. It was kind of interesting, you know, that little tag of Nora. You know, we need to get to dinner or Nora might eat it all. That has happened before. If you think back to Ruby Chibi with the incident with the pancakes. That's exactly what I was thinking of there, too. But technically, Ruby Chibi is not canon. Nothing bad ever happened. <laughs> and just, we got a lot of exposition in this episode. Because there was a lot of conversations and a lot of giving us information in the guise of a conversation. Because you had the conversations between... Yang and Raven, you had the one between Ruby and Oscar, and the third group, Blake and Sun. Mm -hmm. We also got a lot of background information on things from Crow. We also got more information about Mistral as he was interacting with it, looking for these other hunters. I like how you pointed that out in the intro, too. The whole, it looks like they're moving, then it pans out and they're going nowhere, which is kind of what's going on. Yes. Well, the title sequences do an excellent job of foreshadowing because it looks a little bit like the previous season title sequence because that one implies more travel and then this one looks like travel and then they're stuck and they look frustrated, which is what's happening. They have a course that they want to take, but they're not getting anywhere. And Blake gives an excellent breakdown of why they're not getting anywhere because Sun wasn't seeing it. And a lot of people watching may not be seeing it because we're so used to seeing mostly the people from the academies who are not the everyday citizen. We mainly see people from the academies, people from the military. The, when we see the common people, they're usually being rescued. And then we have the grim and the villains. We don't get a lot of just everyday people. I don't think we saw any of the main villains in this. We saw the main secondary villain, which is all of um, the bad parts of the White Fang. Yes, but we didn't see Salem, and we didn't see any of her lieutenants, and we didn't see Cinder, but we saw the White Fang faction. And it's really interesting how he says, I have to keep a promise, going back to Adam. And that also brings up the stuff that Blake was talking about with words matching people. I also like sun, so what's my word? She goes, well, right now I don't really... <laughs> Jury's still out, but I'm leaning towards this. And the whole part where, wait a minute, I taught you something? <laughs> when did I do that? Just the conversations throughout this. I know there's not a lot of fighting going on, but this is the part of the story where we're getting a lot of story. And if you look back at the other seasons where there was a lot of fighting, there wasn't really a lot of story going on. We were getting hints of it and set up for it. And then we got quick executions of it during the final couple episodes. Now we're spending most of the season on filling in information for the story and the world and how these characters are now interacting with each other. Well, it doesn't always have to be all fighting all the time. I just bring that up because a lot of people seem to be like bored when the series does this. And I'm like... I'm here for the fighting and this. Right. If all you want is the fighting, go watch Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty good uh, show to pick for that. Still haven't watched much of Super, but yeah, maybe one day. So far, there's not a lot of fighting in the two episodes I watched. <laughs> Are you sure they weren't just powering up a special? <laughs> uh, no, no. Don't think we're to that part yet. <laughs> Uh, but back to Ruby. Yes, and the conversation between Oscar and Ruby, it looked like Oscar was ready to bail. You don't put your cane in your backpack and put your backpack on to go to dinner. Mm. Well, maybe he didn't want to leave his stuff in the training room. Entirely possible. Because we did see him later. We did, but that was after what Ruby said. And like Ospin said, she is a spark. She can inspire others. 
because Oscar is terrified. Yes, he wanted more, but this was way more and way bigger than he ever envisioned. Yeah, and I really like how Oscar's like, so Ruby was a top hunter at that. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> She's good in some ways. But what's really fascinating about her is the spark you mentioned. <laughs> I also liked how Nora was eating as she was cooking. You know, you gotta taste the food and everything. Oh, yeah. You have to make sure that it doesn't burn. And apparently Ruby can't cook, because... You're gonna burn that. No, I'm not! <sighs> you take over! <laughs> Alright, you take over. Besides, Uncle Crow's calling for me. I didn't know how many people were coming. I got tea! And I love how she was more scared of Yang at first, because I'm like, I'm so sorry! Yes, the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't know what to do. I should have stayed. I just, I didn't know what to do. And then, hug. And then, you know, everyone getting all misty-eyed and everything, and Oscar just kind of walking in on it, going, but I don't really know these people. Hey, voice in my head, who are these people? I'll just let them have their family moment. And then they're both like, come on, wise. <laughs> Bring it in. <laughs> uh, and I wonder how comfortable it is to hug Yang now with that robot arm. Because <laughs> it looks like a lot of pointy bits and parts I could get pinched. <laughs> Yes, and it's not covered with any softer material. It's the straight-up metal. It's not covered like how Penny can pass, you know, a casual touch. When she showed Ruby her hands the first time she stopped a truck. Because it was scraped underneath. It just scraped through a layer of paint. But she has to be able to pass casual contact. Penny, at your service! <laughs> <laughs> Did you just call me a... Fred. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> One of those classic background moments. No, 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 no. So did you have any particular parts you were really curious about? Or any parts you were like, you knew if they did this differently? Or any theories? <laughs> well, as you mentioned before, that whole thing with Adam saying he had a promise to keep. I'm like, okay, which promise and is this one of those vows he made to himself after Blake ran off or is this more of the you know I would let this happen before I would ever let you get hurt so we have to have that happen and then he can hurt her also he's had a lot of problems with Blake's family by the sound of it not just with Blake and the father but I'm but it sounds like other stuff as well, because he's really tired of that family, period. Well, we haven't seen the mother be much of a public figure, but I have a feeling between the father and the mother, the mother is more dangerous. Usually, usually that's how these things work. And I wonder how we're going to get Blake with the others, because it definitely looks like by the end of the season, they'll at least be closer to getting together. But the thing is, Adam Toros isn't a menagerie. So does Blake get captured? Is that how she gets off the island? Because that's one possibility. The other possibility is her and Son get tired of trying to rally the troops and they're like, fine, we'll go to Haven without you guys. I suppose you sense it sounds like some type of messenger was stopped. I couldn't remember which direction the messenger was going, but apparently he's now sleeping at the bottom of the ocean. Yes, it was also interesting to see those waterborne faunas when Blake and Son were trying to collect signatures. And I like the setup. I'm pretty sure we actually saw a little bit of that setup in the intro, too, when they're pulling back. But I was so surprised. I was like, mermaids? <laughs> no, but probably could be mistaken as. But you think about it. Faunus have one aquatic trait, hopefully some sort of fin, and not that they have gills and can't exist outside of water. Because mm. that would get kind of awkward. No, well, maybe they could have gills and be able to breathe air. Just like how Blake has cat ears and normal ears. Mm-hmm. Let's see. There was something I wanted to bring up, and now I can't remember. So please continue, and I'll probably remember one of our other conversations we're going to have here. <laughs> well, you briefly mentioned Crow's exploration looking for the other huntsmen and huntresses. So that had to be Osborne's special list. So Lionheart sent all the special agents out on missions, and now they're all gone. And some of them have been missing for a while, and some of them have been missing for like six weeks or something. That's all I caught when I was reading some of the text on the wall list. And I like how Crow was like, that's not a coincidence. Something's going on here. Yeah, because even Osborne has said some of what Lionheart 
has done is in direct contradiction to the orders I left. Ah, Salem. A tricky, tricky... I almost want to say witch. Especially since there's now magic involved? Yes, that we now have a differentiation between dust and semblances, which most of us would call magic, and actual magic, which kind of makes you wonder, okay, are the relics magic? Hmm, probably. Also, we didn't get any confirmation that that person's the maiden, or what is the relic? Well, the relic would be at the academy, and so we only have our suspicions that that one girl is the maiden, which seems more and more likely because how many people would Raven let know about all her abilities? Because that girl definitely knew. And while she was waiting outside, Raven still allowed her to wait close enough that she was able to overhear and intervene when Yang got a little rowdy. Mm -hmm. And broke her table. At least didn't break the tea set. That was a very lovely tea set. There's so much attention to detail in these later volumes as they're able to have more time, more budgeting, better buildup of assets, improved software. Mm hmm. Because I bet you they have a larger budget now because it's such a popular show. I mean, it's even got a Japanese company dubbing it for Japanese release. Yes, and usually all the stuff goes the other way. It's Japan exporting to the U.S., not the other way around. Hmm, so anything else you want to go over, like any new theories, any new comparisons that we haven't gone over yet for the intro of what's going to happen? Also, the fact that you apparently thought it was guns, not God. Specifically what parts we can tell the audience. The part where you've been messing with, I always thought it was guns because... In this universe, everything is also a gun. And I understood it to be God, and you listen to it again, it's like, oh yeah, that is God. Apparently, all the times I've heard this intro so far, I missed the part where they say a miracle or something. Uh, we can do this, we just need a miracle. I need to pay attention to where that line is said, because I didn't realize that's what was said until the scene passed, so I didn't have a chance to analyze the lyrics and the scene at the same time. So yeah, more and more of the intro is coming to pass. <laughs> Because we now have Aleda having a direct reason that she has to confront Blake. She's supposed to capture Blake. So, you know, it's probably going to start out as a calm meeting, each trying to persuade the other and then devolve into fighting. It's getting really interesting and not boring. <laughs> like I said, some people will probably look at this and go, hmm, this is filler. I'm like, none of this has been filler so far. I mean, Ruby's number of episodes and runtime don't leave a lot of room for filler at all. No, it doesn't. And usually filler occurs when you're transitioning a story from one media format to another. That's why so often anime has filler, because a manga gets popular, they start making a TV series, and the TV series gets through the material too quickly, and they're having to wait for the mangaka to put out new volumes. Or they diverge completely from the story and either come back to it or stay diverged. Because there are some television adaptations that are nowhere near the source material. Love, Hina. <laughs> it's close, but it could have been so much better. Any of that poor guy's stuff, anytime he gets turned into a TV show, they completely off the rails. Yeah, Nagima. There were two versions of that show. Two versions. The second one was closer, but they still kind of... In that sense, there's no room for filler because Ruby is the source material. Mm -hmm. But there can be filler in main stories. Yes, because you can also classify filler as something that does not directly drive the story. Like when you get those episodes that are clip shows, or you get those one-offs that are kind of a comedy adventure where absolutely nothing progresses. But Ruby hasn't really had that. All of that was in Ruby Chibi, which is not canon. And so far, everything in the episodes has been either adding to the story or adding to the world. So in my opinion, that's not filler. And you can have filler in a show by using it to tell you more about the characters. But in my opinion, that's still not filler because we're finding out more about the characters just because the main plot stays still in that episode doesn't mean it's filler. Now, to me, filler is something that has absolutely no value that you would not miss it at all if it was cut from the DVD release. You wouldn't even notice it was missing. So let's see. We talked about Adam. We talked about Blake. We talked about 
Yang, her mother. Why is, is kind of just sitting in the background going, um... Well, you know, she understands difficult family relationships because she gets along so poorly with her father and her brother. Like her reaction when she saw Ruby and Yang getting back together, she's like, oh. Well, she was crying. There was a lot of crying in this episode because we see Oscar cry, we see Ruby cry, we see Weiss cry. Speaking of that, because it made me think of other characters, going back to that moment after Crow goes to the last house and he sees that the does he know where mommy is? Mm -hmm. And he goes to take a drink after he leaves and he decides not to. I interpreted that as it being empty because mm. it was that long of a day. Because mm. he says to the gentleman before he backs off, look, it's been a long day. Just level with me here. I also love how the bartender was like, idiot, after Crow paid off the guy's tab. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling Crow paid him off because he thinks the guy's dead. And he knew the bartender would never get paid back. He said his name's clear now, right? And the bartender's like, yes. Yeah, all that stuff with Crow was actually pretty heavy the more you think about it. Yeah, because he's looking for all of his comrades and they're all gone. And Crow wasn't expecting such a negative reaction with looking for the first guy. He's like, it just reads that I know this guy better than that. He wouldn't run up a tab like that. So the reason the tab isn't paid off is because he's never going to come back. Mm -hmm. And so he pays it off. I also predicted that the knife was going to be stabbed through the door. Well, it was kind of one of those paper doors. It's like, yeah, just walking outside of the establishment wasn't far enough. The real question is, did the guy throw it or did he walk up and stab it through it himself? I would think if he walked up and stabbed himself, it would have hit Crow. Mm. So I, I lean more towards it was thrown. Also, I wasn't quite sure if the guy was sharpening or carving, because his motions weren't quite what would be sharpening movements. No, and usually you sharpen metal against metal, or against stone, and that looked more like wood. But I didn't see any shavings or anything like that, so I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and because he was working with the same piece when Crow came back, which could have possibly been footage reuse, because it didn't visually appear significantly different. So the question is, was it a carving? Was it sharpening? Because he was definitely running the blade over it. I'm thinking they were going for sharpening. But normally you'd use a whetstone. Or one of those long stones. The ones that are, have a handle and they come out. Like the small one I have for sharpening my clippers. Because the piece itself looked more wood-like than stone-like. I was thinking that too. That's why I was like, Carving? Sharpening? It's not changing size, so when there's no shavings, I'm guessing he's sharpening that knife? Yes, or maybe just it's a way to express his frustration that he's repeatedly cutting into this piece of wood. Mm. Though if he was sharpening it, it might explain why Crow felt so threatened at one point. <laughs> like, that's a dagger, I don't want any trouble. I'm just gonna leave now, if that's okay with you. Because Crow didn't want to make that big of a scene. He could have very easily taken the guy out. I mean, come on, he's Crow. Though now that I think about Crow's semblance again, he may not have been the best person to go out to look for people. Well, there's nobody else. Because none of them are at the academy. But it just kind of pops into my head. like, yeah, but everything goes bad for people around him. So. But the thing was, he didn't run into any of them. So things were bad before he got there. Yeah. So, do you have any more? Because I'm pretty sure I skimmed over a lot of things you wanted to talk about. No, I said that I didn't really know what to say this time. Well, we've come up with plenty. So if you can't think of any more and I can't think of any more, shall I move on to our final thoughts? Well, I really like where these two episodes led. I really like the information we got out of them. A lot happened, even though it didn't seem like it. But a lot of background stuff was given to us. A lot more detail about the universe. A lot of confirmations of certain things, like Raven turning into a crow slash raven. Raven would be turning into a raven, I'm sure, because Yang specifically references the bird as a raven, and I always assumed that crow's ability that we saw was an actual crow. And we have most of Team Ruby reunited now, because we have three of the four. Now all we have to do is figure out how to get the other one to them, or them to her. I don't think they know where Blake is, so they don't really know where to look for her. And we know the comm towers are still down, because that information was provided to us by the White Fang Lackeys. 
And that's just a whole other interesting thing there, those two. Hmm, so you're not just blind supporters of Brother Adam. Interesting. You guys are playing a deeper game than I imagined. And it's kind of interesting how we predicted she didn't know about the planned assassination, but apparently she did. Oh, Aelita? Yeah. Both me and you were like, eh, it's going to be interesting when she finds out. Then we found out, oh, she actually already knew. And, well, that's okay. It's for the good of the faunus. And then, yeah, well, you have to do the same thing to your friend's family. Oh, and kidnap her too. <sighs> it's for the good of the faunus? Because you can see that kind of in her. They're pressing and testing her loyalty here. Because there are other people you could ask to take on the Belladonnas that wouldn't have so much of a personal conflict. I wonder if they have a specific reason. Maybe they're testing her to see how good she is for future stuff? Or they know she'll fail and have another reason for it? Well, depending on what their game is, because we got to see Adam's message played back. So we know that he didn't specify who should do what. So those two chose her. So the question is, did they pick her because she would fail? Or did they pick her because she would succeed? You know, what is their end game? Do they still want the Belladonnas around? Do they want to bring Blake back into the White Fang and have her be the new leader? Or do they want Aelita? Or once Adam fails, are the two of them going to step in? Hmm. All possibilities. But I can't wait for the next episodes. <laughs> Shall we go into yours now? It always just feels like we're summarizing for people who didn't watch the first 15 minutes. <laughs> and this has been our thoughts on Ruby, Volume 5, Chapters 5 and 6. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, I hope you enjoyed it, you're still here, right? <laughs> Please like, subscribe, share, comment, check out other videos. Oh, all the usual YouTube please. If you enjoy Lux's art, you can find more of it on DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Google+, Facebook, Reddit, a couple Mastodon servers. Some of those are more consistent than others. Really enjoy Lux's art and would like some personalized art of your own? He does take commissions. Check the link for pricing and availability. No images rattling around in your head but still want to help out? There is both a Patreon and a coffee. Patreon starts at a dollar, which provides access to monthly quick sketches with voting for future projects. And coffee works in increments of three. It's kind of like a tip jar, in case you're feeling tipsy. Thank you again for listening.